Welcome to the National Security Alert, brought to you by the Citizens Commission on National Security. Now here's your host, Roger Aronoff. Okay, all right, my technical team here has got us working. <laughs> so we're at CPAC, final day 2022 in Dallas, Texas, broadcasting live. And I am with the Citizens Commission on National Security. We've been around for about four years. Before that, we were the Citizens Commission on Benghazi. I urge you all to go to our website and learn all about us. Uh, that's CC for Citizens Commission, ccnationalsecurity.org. And I have a couple of great guests lined up for this hour. I know the first one will be along here shortly, but uh, until he does, we'll find stuff to talk about. There's so many national security issues, things that have been raised at this at this uh, conference. Prom prominent among them is the issue of China. And we have Gordon Chang just talking about just really terrible things that they're doing to the Falun Gong, to other people in their country, and the threats they're posing to Taiwan and to many others in, the, in the, that region of the country. Japan, Korea, everyone's quite nervous now about the way China's acting over there. But uh, we're also looking at as national security issues, the southern border of this country. And I just heard Congressman Ronnie Jackson, who was the White House physician to three different presidents, talking about what a disaster it is and how many millions of people have come in in these last two years and where are they and what have they brought with them in this country. So there's so many issues to deal with. Energy, how we've gone from being energy independent to now four, five, six dollar a gallon gasoline. The, the high price of oil has basically finance this war for Russia against Ukraine that we're pouring money into on the other side. To what end? Who knows? Of course, we want to support the Ukrainian people and, and against being taken over by Russia or even have part of their country taken over by Russia, but it seems like we're getting into an endless situation. My guest is just arriving, so I'm going to bring him up and introduce him here in a second. Uh, this is from the Heritage Foundation, James Carafano, stepping up to the plate. He spoke earlier. And here he is. James, good hey, to see you. How are you? You bet. So my, my first guest today is James Carafano of the Heritage Foundation, Vice President of the Institute for National Security and Foreign Policy. He's had an amazing career, 25 years in the military, a lieutenant colonel, a teacher, a historian, an author of a number of books. And at the Heritage Foundation, he is really an intellectual heavyweight, and we've followed him for years. For those of you not aware, the Heritage Foundation has provided much of the intellectual firepower for the conservative movement for decades. This is where people go, what, what is the right policy on economics, on school choice, on foreign policy, and it's always James Carafano when they come to the foreign policy issues. So you've had such an amazing background. Tell me how you got from the military to heritage and doing what you're doing. Well, first of all, I'm such a fan of the show, of you guys, of General Bally and what he's done and what you guys do for fighting for the cause of peace through strength in this country. So so thank you guys for, for what you do, really. Um, you know, I believe, I believe, I just believe God, God God's, uh, guides our lives. Uh, you know, I, I never particularly thought of having a military career. 
uh, it was God and my father that said I should go to West Point, and uh, and I, I was I was in Washington D.C. when I when I retired. I was the a speech writer for the Army Chief of Staff and, and had some other jobs and um, I didn't, never knew really what I wanted to do when I grew up and, and so I actually wound up at, at Heritage because uh, an Army buddy who worked at Heritage in, in, invited me to come over and join their team. That was almost 20 years ago so I've only had two jobs in my life <laughs> which is the Army and Heritage but um, the reason why I always stayed um, is because at Heritage I got that same sense of mission that I did in the, the Army. It was this idea of selfless service. You're there to, to do something, to give back. Uh, and so it's just always been so fulfilling for me. And uh, so I I, uh, I I can't think of any other place I'd rather work. Terrific. Well, and, and better in the Army, nobody shoots at you. <laughs> <laughs> Even all the way up to Lieutenant Colonel, huh? Yeah. Well, we have a lot of issues in common that we both follow and prescribe solutions for. Today, you were talking about energy as right. one of the national security issues. Tell us how that is such as a national yeah, I, Look, I think, uh, um, uh, first of all, I am so excited that CPAC had this as an issue on their agenda. I'm such a fan of CPAC. Um, you know, conservatives never really got a seat at the table. And what, what Matt Schlapp and the leaders, they said, well, we're just gonna build our own table. And they have created this place where conservatives can come together and talk about issues that are really important. And energy is, I mean, I, I know it sounds kind of geeky to some people and they go, like, okay, gas prices, but the reality is, is there, there are just three things that, that we cannot lose on. The, the, like failure is not an option. One, it, as you know, is electoral integrity. You lose the right to vote, you lose your political liberty, you're done. The other one's peace through strength. If we cannot provide for the common defense, China and Russia and Iran, they want a world without America and they'll find a way to do that. The other one is energy. Without reliable, abundant, affordable energy, you will not have prosperity, uh, you will not have a, a future. I mean, it is, this, is the, this is the crucial fundamental thing that drives a modern society. So getting energy wrong is just not an option. And what Biden is doing and what the green agenda represents is not an energy agenda. It's not an economic agenda. It's not an environmental agenda. It's a political agenda. It's designed for them to take over. It's designed for them to take over the country in the most fundamental way they can in reorganizing the economy. and the, and the problem is not only, obviously, is it, do they want to take all the political power, but if you actually look at what they're trying to do, it defies the laws of physics, chemistry, and economics. It's unachievable. So uh, there, other than taking away your vote and leaving you undefended, their energy policies, I think, are the greatest threat to the average American citizen in the world today. Well, and I was just commenting before you came how the situation by what they've done with energy, how it's, the prices have gone up, we're no longer energy independent and basically able to fill up the world with what they need. So now we've got this situation where Russia is making so much money off their energy, still selling to Europe, again, thanks to Biden and the Nord Stream policy, right. that uh, we're financing their side of the war far more than we're even helping Ukraine. Yeah, no, it's a great, point and and uh, you know it's not only a, like a threat to our prosperity that we don't that we don't have that we're not energy independent it, it also as you said is an issue of, of foreign policy when, when America like it was under Donald Trump was energy dominant we were driving world policies um, and uh, but it's also and I don't think a lot of people understand this this is also a humanitarian issue I mean we're a modern society there are there are billions of people in this world who don't have electricity. There are women that spend their entire lives parting the water, and that's as far as they'll ever get in their life. Um, this agenda condemns them to living in the Stone Age forever, because they're never going to be elect. They're never going to be electrified. They're never going to have a world that's powered by gas and, and I mean, solar and wind power. So, it, and this is imposing on them permanent poverty, permanent suffering, 
uh, permanent insecurity. So, so Biden's agenda is also a massive humanitarian crisis. And the other thing, and to me, this is the most thing that liberals should get is, it's also not a good environmental agenda. I mean, we only have one planet, <laughs> right? We all get that, right? We all want to take care of the blue dot. The green agenda will not actually address global warming. Even if it did, if they did everything they said, which physically they cannot do, it won't actually reduce the temperature of the planet, which is just nuts. So we're going to impoverish ourselves, and we're actually not going to affect the climate. And the reality is, is you know, we we do this thing every year called the um, uh, the Index of Economic Freedom, and and we've been doing it for like 30 years. What what the data shows is very clear: is the countries that are the best stewards of the environment in the world are the richest and the freest. So the richer you are and the freer you are, the better environmental outcomes you deliver. Absolutely. Natural gas that we, you know, there, there's so many solutions and they have the idea of windmills and solar panels. And it's just nonsense. Solar panels. The United States has the cleanest water, the cleanest air, and the cleanest environment on the planet Earth. And the reason is we can afford to do that. And it is that environmental mitigation that's way more impactful than trying to take carbon out of the environment. That's just nuts. It's completely nuts, and it's really not scientifically sound anyway. Well, and what's happened is, you know, the, I think the war in Ukraine has really opened up this debate, and and uh, and people are beginning to see that what they're pushing isn't really reality. That you know, we're in Texas for CPAC. Nobody is the poster child for this stupidity more than Texas, which in, which through subsidies poured tons of money into renewable wind and solar, and, and which are and Texas today has a, a a much more unstable grid and much more unreliable energy and much higher costs because they've massively subsidized something with, which can't deliver the uh, the base load they need to power their economy. And there's another national security issue that's still tied to energy, but let's move on to some other things, which is Iran. Right. The, the Biden administration is desperate to get back into the JCPOA, take the sanctions off Iran, let them make hundreds of billions of dollars more, of which we know what they're going to do with it. It's, you know, terrorism and, and all that, uh, you know. So, so what about Iran and that yeah, issue? The the Biden administration is kind of like the movie Hot Tub Time Machine. They they just want to morph back like to the Obama era, right? And just and and whether it is uh, placating China, trying to reset with the Russians uh, in the Middle East, they think they can just go back to the Iran deal and that's going to solve everything. And even though the the demonstrable evidence that it's really really not. Uh, look, the reality is is an Iran deal cannot stop. Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. They have all the technology and everything they need right now to build a nuclear weapon. That's a political decision that the Iranians are going to make, not a not a technical decision. So while you're investing in trying to do a deal, which demonstrably we already know can't deliver, uh -huh. makes no sense. And and what are you going to accomplish? You're going to pour money into the Ra Iranian regime. Obama did that. And what we found is the more money you give the Iranians, the more dangerous they become. So it's a, uh, it's going to fail, and uh, and they're going to set the world on fire. Well, and you wonder, is this just bad judgment? Is this stupidity? Or well, is there something more sinister at work? Yeah, I was, actually, I was just on a, a show with our good friend Frank Gaffney, yeah. you know, who does a terrific show. And there, I think there's two parts to this. Because, I look, I'll, I know a lot of the people in, in the government, because I've been in Washington for a long time. And they're just... They're just progressive functionaries, right? They'll just do what the what the left want them to do, and uh, but then the, then you also have to ask: there are other people in this administration who are of the same mindset and belief of people that are just trying to destroy this country, and and uh, and they believe in Marxism, they believe in communism, they believe that we're the bad guys, and they're, I think, consciously self-destructing. This country and what we're doing so yeah it's a problem so what keeps you up at night mostly what worrying about which issue say the top two national security issues i, I will tell you well obviously china is the 
the real pacing threat in the world today. There's no question about that. The, the ones that worry me the mo most, we talked about the Middle East and basically letting Iran run wild. I think that's, that's you know, the most dangerous thing. But I worry a lot about Latin America. People are just not have their own. This is our own backyard, our own neighborhood. Of course, what we're doing on immigration and border security has made it worse. But China is in Latin America in a major way. They see that as a free. So we're going to wind up with China owning the countries in our backyard. That's a disaster. And the problem with this administration is we've seen leftist government after leftist government come to power. They're all in bed with China. They're Marxists, they're communists. And the response from the Biden administration is, well, they're leftists like we are. They can't be such bad people. But not only are they, are they uh, leftists in the bad way we are, they're also anti-American. And so this administration is letting, the, letting an anti-American left run wild in Latin America. And that, I think, is the biggest problem we're seeing today that we're just not paying attention to. Well, at the same time, our southern border is wide open. So people coming from Latin America and all sorts. At the end of Biden's term, in all likelihood, the illegal immigrant population in the United States will be double what it was when he came into office. And to show you how big a number that is, if that was a state in the union, it would be like the fourth or fifth biggest state in the country. They've been saying it's 11 million for about 30 years now. How many would you estimate uh, illegal aliens? It's be over 20 million, easily, over 20 million. James, it's been great having you on here. Well, thank any, you. Do you have any final thoughts? Or no, I, well, first of all, folks should listen to the show because it's a great place. Uh, but you know, we, all, we have to get out of the learning and educating business and get into doing business. If, if we don't take this country back, um, you know, we, it's nobody's fault but ours. But I go back to the big three issues. If people need to be really concerned about election integrity um, on this issue, on energy issue, they really need. And look, we live in a dangerous world, and, and we cannot run away from that. And at the end of the day, having a military that's trained and ready and, uh, and get them out of this woke business, all this other stuff, that's really, really important. We have a big to-do list, but it, uh, Americans have to really they, they got to put their head in the game. Tell people how they can find you at Heritage and how they can follow you on social media. Well, so I'm JJ Carafano at, on Twitter, right? Uh, Heritage.org's got all our stuff. I also really, really recommend people that really want to get involved and be activists that they connect with our sister organization, Heritage for America. Um, Heritage for America is a great way to get involved in local politics. Uh, so that's a, an opportunity to not just learn about things like you can from Heritage, but to get involved in doing things. So, for example, we recently put out a report that talks about what people can do to deal with the threat of Chinese malicious activities in their own states and communities. We also put out a report about dealing with um, immigration and border security at the state and local level. So there's actually a lot of things that people can do without coming to Washington to make a big, big difference. So, and the best fastest way to do, do that is to connect with Heritage um, Action for America, Heritage Action. And I second that. Heritage, I've gone to their website so many times over the last three decades, and they're fantastic. And James, thank well, you thank so you. much for being thanks, with thanks, us. Thanks for having me, my friend. Okay. Thank you. All right. We're going to a commercial, or are we going to... Okay, looks like we're staying on the air here. And got another really interesting guest coming up right away. Hi, David. Good to meet you. Great, thank you. Well, again, we're... right in front of you. Okay. We are, we are broadcasting again from CPAC live on Saturday, August 6th here. And uh, my get, next guest is David Tice. David started an investment management and uh, analysis firm in 1996. And he's been involved in finance and investment for many years. And somewhere along the way, you became a filmmaker too, huh? 
I did that kind of at a later stage of life. I was involved in a feature film called Soul Surfer that in, it was a story about Bethany Hamilton and her story of persistence and faith that really helped motivate hundreds of millions of people, I believe. It's quite a story. I remember seeing that. She was bit by a shark. Is that, yeah. Exactly. She's lost an arm to a shark. Right, right. Okay. And so uh, what got you involved in film as an investor and then you just took to it? Yes, as an investor initially, but then I've recognized the power of film for a long time, how it's a medium that can really cause people to take action and alert them to the truth. And recently this film documentary, Grid Down, Power Up, I became a believer of because I've been a worrier about our geopolitical situation and our vulnerability. Good, yeah, I'm definitely going to get into that and talk about that. I watched the film last night. It is fascinating and very well done. Thank you. And I say that I've produced and directed six documentaries myself, so yeah. so we've got something in common. And I don't come from a film school background either, you know, but uh, but more from as a journalist, and that led me into that. So let's talk about your film, uh, Grid Down, Power Up. Uh, tell us how, how you came to get involved with that project. Well, really, this was a low-hanging fruit opportunity because somebody else, Patria Patrick, had been working on this film for a few years and unfortunately hadn't gotten it over the finish line. And I felt like it was about 70% done and, you know, got a little bit further into it so it wasn't quite that high a percentage done. But I feel like God was guiding me once I found out about it and... I love, I probably wouldn't have started on my own, but seeing that it was partly done, I felt like it was a great opportunity and felt like I possess the skills and the initiative and some resources to make this happen. And, you know, I knew it was so important to get this story out to the country. God was guiding me to devote a couple years to this effort. Well, I've been reading about this issue for years and it's the, the EMP, the electromagnetic pulse, and the, the possibility of exploding a nuclear weapon in, uh, in the stratosphere, and, and I guess the stratosphere, and then how that can completely take out our power grid. So it seems like something that stays on the fringe, but you, you have the best Peter Pry and Jim Woolsey talking about it, and I've seen their work on this for years but it never seems to break into the mainstream. It never gets talked about. The, the president never gets asked about it. And, and talk about what an important issue it is and what we need to be aware of. Okay, so that was a great introduction. And as you said, uh, this has kind of been considered a right-wing fringe cause as far as electromagnetic pulse or EMP when a nuclear blast goes up off 200 miles into the atmosphere and it creates gamma waves to essentially wipe out electronics and therefore it would wipe out our transformers and cause if our electricity system goes out for more than six months more than 200 million people will likely die a congressional commission found that as many as 90 percent of americans could die so what we did that's a little different with this film is we widen the approach to not just electromagnetic pulse, but also cyber attack, physical attack, and then geomagnetic disturbance or a solar flare. So I think by widening it, we've made this a little bit more mainstream and now people can understand the grid could go down from any of those four threat vectors. One of the things you mentioned in the film is, I believe North Korea has launched two satellites that might not be satellites, and what what is that about? So they have launched two satellites that currently, you know, rotate the Earth, and then we can measure if there's data being exchanged back and forth, which is a reason most often for a satellite, and there's no data coming back and forth, and therefore esteemed Senator Bob Hall from Texas, you know, who was actually one of the first patriots back 
50 plus years ago was involved in helping harden the Minuteman missile. He's an electronics engineer uh, with a great deal of skill. He led the effort to harden, you know, that Minuteman missile system. So he has as much knowledge about this as anyone. He proposes that the only reason that it, it was either a complete dud or it's ready potentially to, you know, fire, you know, an, a missile that would create electromagnetic pulse. Okay. So tell us how this has been dealt with politically. The House, the Senate, the White House. In other words, the, the case you make is that it's really not that expensive, you know, to... to strengthen the grid so that it could resist this if, if they actually did it. But so why doesn't it get done? Who is opposed to it? Well, I'll tell you, it's, it's a complicated mess. And part of the complexity is our utilities need to spend dollars for various equipment. And we know how to do this because the military has worked on is called hardening, you know, their infrastructure, their command control centers, their missile systems, et cetera. But the utilities get paid based on their rate base and then they get paid for that. And then there's uh, various constituent groups, citizen groups that try to keep rates down. And therefore it's complicated to get reimbursed for that and frankly the utilities just don't want to be told what to do and they frankly feel like this is a low probability event and they just as soon not be involved in that and so on the political side on the legislative side Barack Obama actually tried back in 2015 to initiate legislation protecting against solar storms or geomagnetic disturbance and he actually passed an executive order, but then it essentially stagnated with the regulatory arm. Uh, there's something called the North American Electric Reliability Council, which is NERC. And NERC essentially studied it, and with a bunch of input from the public utilities, they selected benchmark solar storms, and there were some big storms up here and here, and they chose a benchmark storm that was here, you know, which is ridiculous. And therefore, they enacted standards that protect against this level storm where there's a chance of this level storm. And therefore, it's ridiculous. And therefore, there's been ineptitude and lack of follow through. And is there no senator who has taken up this issue and really fought for it and, and tried to whip the votes in his caucus or to, to make this happen? Okay, so there have been a number of legislators that have fought for this. Senator Ron Johnson from uh, Wisconsin has been a real uh, battler and fighter for this. He's been talking about this for a long time. I want to mention another president. President Donald J. Trump also passed an, an executive order back in 2019 protecting the electric grid. That was codified into law in 2020, the National Defense Authorization Act. But then, unfortunately, he left office and it has been, you know, stagnated and obstructed inside Department of Energy, inside Department of Homeless Security, and frankly, not much has been done. A final thing, California, in 2018, the democratically controlled legislature passed unanimously two bills you know, imploring the U.S. federal government to protect our power grid against EMP and GMD. And essentially, four years later, nothing's really been done. That happened in California, in huh? California, 2018. Well, so that sort of takes it away from being a left-right issue. I mean, it's, it's California, the most left-wing state, perhaps, you know, that, that passed a bill like that. I mean, it's not really a political issue. So if anybody wants to target this film as a right wing cause, I can show them that 90 seconds and, you know, that blows away that argument. So do you know of any country, Russia, North Korea, as you say, that is strategizing that this is the way they want to come at us as far as to cripple the U.S.? And 
So we know through defectors that this particular electromagnetic pulse attack is, or bringing down the power grid, is a tactical strategy that is in these war plans. We know that special forces training, even among the United States, you know, when we, you know, encounter, you know, various operations, the special forces guys know to take out the power grid. And so we, we know this is a potential. We know of a Russian general involved in arms control discussions with one of our legislators, you know, ended up uttering to him when they were talking about missiles, well, we, we would just use an electromagnetic pulse attack and wipe out your power grid. Well, so this relates also to cybersecurity, right? And you talked about hundreds of attacks that are related to this, correct? Yes. So Jennifer Granholm, who's Secretary of Energy under Joe Biden right now, she was on a Sunday talk show not that long ago, and she was asked directly if our adversaries are inside the grid and could they shut down our power grid? And she said, yes, they could. And she said, there are thousands of attacks. We, we know that there have been attacks on our meat packing plants, on our pipelines, on, you know, various areas of our infrastructure. Uh, there was three different attacks in the Ukraine, you know, in the 2015, 2017 time zone that where the Russians, you know, s shut down infrastructure in inside the Ukraine. And there, there's a lot of talk that that was simply a test kitchen about how they might replicate that kind of attack for the United States. So would the same solutions for hardening the grid apply to EMP as to cyber hacking? Well, they're, they're slightly different and then some of the software, you know, fixes for uh, cyber are different, but there are various protective mechanisms that are uh, potentially s sufficient for both. But there, there just needs to be a uh, strategy to protect against all hazards. So what has been the impact of your film and what do you hope to happen and to play it out uh, as it would go if, if you have it your way? So we're just getting started. Uh, we just had our Texas premiere uh, two nights ago. We had a Colorado premiere. It was shown at the Republican State Convention where we had 500 people in two sessions, standing room only. It received a standing ovation. So uh, it's going to be available on Ep Epoch TV about next week uh, for a two week pay-per-view exclusive period then it's going to be available on our website for free we're utilizing a pay it forward campaign where if people would like to donate a few shekels then 25 percent of any proceeds are going to go to 501c3 organizations to fight for grid protection okay. tell me what other plans do you have as far as maybe other films or other work in this public policy area well, th this is my mission for a while, and we, we're creating a U.S. Energy Security Council. And frankly, this movie is becoming a movement, and therefore I'm going to help lead that movement along with Jeffrey Hazlett, who's the president of C-Suite Network. We together are forming this U.S. Energy Security Council, and that's going to provide the infrastructure and organization where there can be collaboration between legislators, their aides, regulators, vendors, as well as citizen warriors to figure out the best practices and try to figure out how we can get better legislation, better fixes, and protect our nation's grid. So elaborate on the point you made that it's the utility companies that seem to be the biggest obstacle to this hardening taking place. So the public utilities 
do a great job, and, and there's a great number of patriots that are very heroic in keeping their lights on. But unfortunately, we feel like there's been <coughs> a concept of regulatory capture, where essentially the, the regulators are so you know, behold to the industry that it is not as objective as it should be. And there's there's a number of utility executives that frankly have not gone far enough in spending the right kind of money. And part of that is an issue about rate reimbursement. One of our recommendations in the film is that this grid security be paid for by the federal government and not, you know, put on the utilities themselves and to have it get uh, reimbursed through the rate mechanism. So we're kind of taking them off the hook a little bit. And again, it's very, very complicated. But frankly, at the end of the day, we feel like the utilities and some of their think tanks that support them, their lobbying organizations have not done all they should have done. But normally, you know, this type of thing, if it's an issue of money for them, you know, federal government subsidizes a lot of things. Is this, this not one that they want to subsidize? Well, there's there's just been lack of follow through. And, and frankly, Donald Trump's bill uh, and then the National Defense Authorization Act really laid out a lot of things. But then there's been there needs to be better follow-up. And if I think Trump would have been in office, he would have been following through a little bit more. There was an executive order relative to the grid. And then unfortunately that executive order was, you know, invalidated Biden's first day in office. And what, what do you think their motivation was? Just anything that Trump did is bad and we don't want to be a part of it? Or do you think the, the idea of not having a hardened grid system is something that they want to leave us vulnerable. I mean, it just seems like it's such a vulnerability. And if we get hit, whether by cyber or EMP and lose the grid, the, the, the consequences are so catastrophic. It would seem like this would be such a high priority. It obviously is to you. And we're grateful to you to met for making it that way. And, um, so, well, it's, it's really hard to speculate on their rationale, but, you know, it's, it's not good. And tell us a little about Peter Pry. He has been the guy that has been talking about this for so many years. And you feature him in the film. And, and where, where's he coming from on this? What's, so Peter Pry is an amazing patriot who works day and night on this issue and he was the executive director for the EMP commission for which operated for 17 years you know which was staffed by the best and brightest scientists in the country and they did extensive reports about with conclusions and how this should be fixed and he has written multiple books on this and on our website, griddownpowerup.com, you can see many articles and links to some of his books. And his he's done a pry report, you know, which is on the internet. You can hear him espouse at length. He is 100% obviously all bore for this, and you know he he's become a little bit, you know, skeptical and you know. Uh, worried if it's going to get done and that's why uh, to me this has got to be an um, emotional issue this has got to we've got to get ticked off soccer moms and dads we've got to have people look at the, our substations around the corner and see how they're behind chain link fences and and realize that you know there there has not been enough attention focus on you know what Americans and human beings in general are, are just complacent. We, we just tend to think that everything will operate as it was yesterday, and it might not. So annually we spend $800 billion plus on defense in this country. And what would you estimate the cost would be to harden the grid sufficiently that we could withstand such an attack? 
Well, it can be done in pieces, and frankly, there's some different estimates out there about if, if we just try to harden critical nodes, you know, against uh, geomagnetic disturbance and a partial EMP protection, it could be as low as $10 billion. It, Total $10 billion, and yeah. we could solve the whole issue, huh? Yeah, and, and again, that's not completely solving it, but it provides a great deal of protection. I'm saying that certainly under $100 billion, you know, this could be accomplished. We have a $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill out there right now, and Tommy Waller, uh, executive vice president of Center for Security Policy, who heads up the Secure the Grid Coalition, estimates one-third of 1% 1 could essentially harden a great deal of the, of the grid from that particular bill. Well, this seems like a great issue waiting for some politician to grab onto it and fight it to the end. And you've provided much of the firepower and the research to help them get to that point. It really seems amazing to me that with all this effort and that, that they ignore this and, and leave us vulnerable to this risk. It truly is amazing. and. Your viewers will find a range of emotion as they watch the film from surprise to disbelief to outrage to fear to despair. And then we try to end them at the end of the movie with hope and patriotism and hopefully more outrage and then hopefully energized to make something happen. Because one of the things that we need is truly something like a Tea Party movement where, where people are ticked off enough that they send the trailer and this film to 10 of their friends and get them to send it to 10 of their friends. And we can get this done if, if we all work together, but if we sit back and drink our Chardonnay, nothing's gonna happen. So tell people how they can see the film, get the film, what links, how to follow you on social media, anything you want them to know about that. Okay, so we, we have, uh, Twitter, we have Facebook, we, we have Instagram. It's all under Grid Down Power Up. Our website is griddownpowerup.com. The film will be available directly from the website about August 30th or so. It's available on epochtv.com about August 15th or so. <coughs> and uh, they can go to our website right now and register at the bottom and they will get alerts about when the film is available. We also have outreach campaign under the participate section where you can just add your home address and a few clicks of your mouse and you can have letters written to your U.S. Congressperson, your two U.S. Senators, your governor, and your uh, therefore imploring them to take action. We have another area that will allow you to reach out to state regulators and then also to your board of directors of your public utilities. That's great information and an action plan that you have there and all that. So uh, have I missed anything? Is there anything else you want to add that uh, you think people should know about it or about your work or your future plans? Well, thank you so much for your heroic patriotism and your efforts on your show. I mean, your viewers are lucky to have you. And uh, we just need concerned patriots to, you know, to just take action and go to our website and spend the time to register and spend time to tell your friends about it, watch the film. We need community activism as well. And so uh, there, there's a lot of, uh, and become a grid warrior where, where we're gonna have grid down power up webs, uh, t-shirts and hats available and spread the word. And so on the community initiative, we feel like city councils, mayors, uh, city managers can start to get involved protecting their own city. One of the ideas, there's a group out of Rangeley, Colorado that is protecting their water systems, their municipal water system, their wastewater system, and then a recreation center to be able to disperse food. And they got a $5 million grant from 
U.S. Congress. We say uh, they're creating a microgrid to provide uninterrupted power to the water systems. So people don't realize that human beings will die after three days if they don't have water. But our water systems are dependent upon the grid. And therefore, if the grid goes down, they may have a backup generator, but they probably don't have any more than 10 days of backup fuel. And therefore, there's no reason that we shouldn't have microgrids protecting all of our domestic water supply. Makes good sense <laughs> to me. So, uh, well, I thank you for your work and for your efforts and no, no future plans for another film uh, in the works? Uh, right now, I mean, I okay. Yeah, this, this is great. I tell you, yeah. Roger, there, there's a chance that this uh, formula that I've developed about creating this Align Act, you know, letters and phone calls to legislators and regulators and turning movies into movements and then getting uh, concerned warriors to go to work and then we're donating 25% of film proceeds to uh, 501c3 organization to fight for it and then utilize a pay it forward campaign. I think that formula could work for a lot, number of other causes. And we'll see if this works, we might be able to create, you know, programs and campaigns and movements for other important causes. And how has CPAC been for you? Have you ever been to a CPAC before? And I've, uh, I've been a couple times and it's it's been amazing. This is the the best, you know, one yet, because I think the film's further along, but great, you know, heroic patriots that want to do the right thing, and, and it's an amazing experience. Okay, well, thank you, David. It's been great having you on, and I wish you all the best luck with this, and that the goal that you set out for to succeed is to get our grid hardened, and uh, so we're safe from that. You could be a national hero if you you know this makes that happen and i appreciate what you're doing well i'm trying to do the, the lord's work and yeah trying to but, but now it's up to us so let's make yeah. it happen we're going to choose power up not grid down power up not grid down okay our guest has been david tice please take a look at his film and buy it and support what he's doing because i think it's really important work david Great having you on. Thank you. All right. That was fun. Feel free to have me on again. Okay. Yeah. Uh, great. Let me keep it going. Uh, I will. Think so I'm good. Still I'm glad on you the... watched the film yesterday. Yeah, I yeah. did. Yeah. I watched great. it last night. Great. Fantastic. Well, that's Terrific. just great effort on your part. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Are we still going live, huh? Where, where are you based, brother? I'm now in Austin, Texas. Austin. I was in Washington for 25 years. Well, you're a fellow Texan? Yeah, I grew up in Houston. Yeah. Where do you where are you from? I'm in Dallas. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, what part of Austin? The domain. Right. Domain. Uh huh. Yeah. You know that? Yeah. I've got a ranch between <laughs> uh, Dallas and Austin. Oh, okay. I mean, yeah. We'll talk. All right. <laughs> so we've got a few minutes here left, I guess. Paul. Paul, come sit down. With Can I have a direct email for you? Yeah, here you go. <laughs> Wait, not there, but there you go. Yeah, live TV. Thank you. We're in okay? Okay, that looks good. So I'm here with Paul Vallee, uh, one of the... That's great. One of the founding members uh, with me and Tom McInerney and Ace Lyons right. of the Citizens Commission on Benghazi and then the Citizens Commission on National Security. And uh, it's been a, amazingly a nine year ride we've been on now. Yeah. So, uh, and you know, I recall, um, and if I can remember correctly, we sort of kicked it off at the National Press Club, yeah. right? And uh, that was in July, of July of 2013. We had 13, yeah. and we took it upon ourselves to uh, form uh, a group that was going to look deeply into Benghazi, yes. right? 
That's why we did it. And so uh, we put a group of us together. Some of us had been in the intelligence business and uh, in the media business, but uh, we really investigated that. We probably did a more in-depth investigation than the Congressional Committee did. Remember, uh, Trey Gotti was heading that up, I think? Absolutely, and it was so timely because he had his press conference to announce his final report. He didn't release it that day, but that was the day he basically said, here's 800 pages read it for yourself and come to your own conclusion, you know, and that's what we thought. No, you know, you had a bigger responsibility than that, Trey Gowdy. We were all thrilled when you were appointed to be the head of that committee, but we will give you, and again, if you go to our website, ccnationalsecurity.org, click on the Benghazi tab, you'll see our reports where we actually connect the dots, name names, I'd say hold people accountable, but no one really was ever officially held accountable, but we, we did in our reports. All of our press conferences are up on there. You can see it all, but uh, yeah. And, and after that, we have decided we wanted to cover other issues, so that's why we started the CCNS. Yeah, I moved into Citizens Commission for National Security. But going back to that, and then we can talk about CCNS, uh, the lies that were told in front of Trey Gotti by Hillary Clinton, General Dempsey, who was chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and Panetta. They lied. They said we didn't have enough intelligence, we didn't have enough information, and we didn't have the assets in the Mediterranean all proven wrong later as I continued part of the investigation and we got soldiers, airmen, naval uh, staffers down at Central Command that said yes, we had ships at sea, we had special operations forces, we had drones, we had aircraft in Italy, aircraft uh, in Spain, right? Yeah, and plus the fleet aircraft and Marines. So they all lied. And what was interesting, Roger, the State Department took that mission over. That should have been a Defense Department mission to go in and rescue those people in Benghazi, the four that, that we lost. cross-border authority. Um, yeah, I mean, it was absolutely ridiculous because you never leave anybody behind, okay? And uh, America put those soldiers at that comp. Uh, they're contractors, actually, they, but they're ex, you know, special forces and SEALs and all that. Um, but the fact of it, they were Americans doing a, a job overseas and hired by the American government. And we violated that, and we left them behind. And of course, they were later rescued and brought out. But we had lost four great Americans uh, that night over that 13 hours. But uh, yeah, and I, I really appreciate your leadership in transitioning to our new, our new title, which is Citizens Commission on National Security, where we're looking at many different threats against America. And then you are able to gather in a lot of the uh, uh, interviews that are done by the members of CCNS, articles that have been written by members, and uh, being able to consolidate that and put it on one platform for people uh, you know, to read or look at. Thank you, yeah, for saying that. And it's, uh, it's been a, the honor and adventure of my life to be working with all of you and Alan West and Claire Lopez and the members of uh, Special Operations Speaks and Charles Jones, who helped us so much get this thing started. Tom McInerney, your co-author and dear friend and dear friend of ours who actually led the attacks into Libya in 1986. So he knew when they were saying, well, we couldn't get the planes there in time, how ridiculous Those aircraft that came out of England at that time, remember? Yeah, yeah. For Libya to get Gaddafi, which was another mistake by Clinton. Okay, folks, well, it's been two great days here. Uh, at, at CPAC and we're going to wrap it up but this is the National Security Alert myself executive director and my good friend and co-founding member Paul, Major General Paul Valley and we're signing off and we'll see you next week with another recorded show on the National Security Alert thank you all